Mics are open. All righty then. Hello and welcome to the Geek on My Sleep channel. For those of you new to the channel, my name is Carl and I believe I point this way. Yeah. Oh, other way. This way. And my oh, co-host Peter. Anyway, hello. Peter. Yeah, trying to make all the screens fit. Yeah, try and make all the screens fit. Um, in today's Geek Out session, we are going to be doing a live book discussion of The Last Wish, the first book in the Witcher series. Um, it's also known as Point Five in this series, so not quite one, but the first book in the series written by, uh, do my best attempt at the Polish name, Andrzej Sapkowski, uh, originally written in Polish and translated to English. The Witcher is a huge franchise, um, recently came out on Netflix, uh, but for Peter and myself, this is our first impression of The Witcher. And, you know, before we get too much further, spoiler alert. There is going to be discussion of the book. If you don't want any spoilers, please abort now. But we might have some unpopular opinions about this book. So, Pete, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. I think uh, unpopular opinion fits. But on the basis of this is our first experience with it, you know, mm -hmm. we saw there have been several games, there's been comic strips, there's been books. So it's a big franchise, figured might mm -hmm. as well check it out. Yeah, I, I think uh, some of the first games in the books were published in the early 90s. So this franchise has been around for a while and I haven't played any of the games. Have you? Uh, no, I briefly, you know, watched uh, my wife play a couple or she's okay. played a little bit of the third one but okay. you know with her headphones on so i'm just kind of doing my own thing look over and yeah. see her yeah. fighting something and shooting fire most of my exposure to the witcher before this was just seeing it on steam uh seeing some of the memes float around and then when netflix series uh took off just seeing everything there um but yeah, overall, before we get into the nitty gritty details, what were what was your impression of The Last Wish? So for me, it, it was very lackluster, and I guess it, it kind of softens the blow that they put it as a 0. 0.5, and that mm. just kind of messes with me on a different level because I guess in regards to my anime, you have so many episodes and then you have a 10.5, which is a recap of everything. So right. for a 0.5, it kind of feels like a, a prequel or a mm -hmm. precursor. Mm -hmm. I, it was very lackluster. Like there wasn't a whole lot of world building and all we really got was our main character and his kind of moral compass for it right. and i guess a taste of the world where you know we've got these monsters and we barely get a sprinkling of a couple different races but I, it's not typically what i get out of a fantasy for really developing the world and you know from the beginning and i guess that's probably where i'm coming from i do a lot of lit rpgs where it's from the beginning level one or mm -hmm. in a new world and you get to see the whole progression Meanwhile, we start off and he's already a badass. So right, right. Yeah, I um, I'm 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 along the same lines. I I had to stop and ask myself, did I come into the last wish with too high expectations because of all the hype, or did I, you know, um, have grounds to be disappointed? I I mean, like, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the last wish. I'm very interested in the franchise. Um, eventually going to check out the Netflix series. Like it's, it's an interesting world. Um, 
but when I talk to other people about The Witcher, like it's up there with a lot of the classics. And I came in with really high hopes. And we actually had uh, a couple other people who were supposed to be on this stream with them. And I was talking to one of them. And uh, they actually put it down and moved on to another book for a little bit just because it didn't grab them. Um, but yeah, yeah so it's good. With that being s- oh, go ahead. With that being said, it's with the understanding that it is a big franchise and it is the first book, but it's not even the first book. It's a point five. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. it's a collection of short stories, which um, when I was doing a bit of research for this uh, geek out session, I heard some mix mixed feedback on it. Some people thought it was a good thing that it was a collection of short stories. You get little snapshots of um, our main character, um, Gerald of Rivia, um, kind of in different jobs um, because he's a witcher. He's pretty much a freelancer taking on jobs against monsters. Um, But then others like myself, I I think I would have enjoyed a bit of a longer book that did more of the world building, spent a little bit more time explaining the magic. Um, We get some explanation throughout it. um, And I feel like each of the short stories, we get a little bit more um, like with the the Witcher, um, depending on how you look at it, the, the first or the second story in there, um, you know, it talks about the potions that he uses, right? And kind of explains a bit of uh, how that works and how it makes him, him stronger and, and faster and, and why he can drink it because of um, the mutations that he's undergone that makes him resistant to like disease and and all these other things. So they sprinkle it in. um, And again, I think that's partially the short story format. Uh, But yeah, I I much rather have had more of that going in. And I feel that a lot of the short stories and correct me if you feel differently, we're really just relying on the readers kind of being familiar with these type of fantasy settings. I I guess familiar with the setting, but for me, I, I agree. I would have liked a little more sustenance for world building, you know, what's going on. And I can I can see it as kind of like a, not really a mystery, but a lead in, you know, they, they keep sprinkling it and wanting, you know, because you want to know more about the magic system or the world, you'll continue. But mm-hmm. this book really just gave a flavor of the main character's moral compass, Mm -hmm. if you will. And that's okay. So it is what it is for the book, but that's what this book felt like. It felt like, Hey, okay. We get kind of a a medieval feel. We've got magic. We've got, you know, the witcher who apparently went under rigorous training somewhere and now Mm -hmm. has these innate, power-esque things that he can also supercharge with his elixirs right right um and so kind of kind of get into that and we talked a little bit about it um before the stream but um i i felt like yeah this does a good job kind of introducing us to Geralt and his moral compass but the first or second depending on how you look at it um short story the witcher it was originally published in a magazine. I felt like this one had a little bit different flavor than the rest of them. Um, the Witcher, uh, it's essentially, you know, he kills three men in a bar fight right away before he's escorted to the castle inn um, and eventually goes to the king. Um, he seems a lot harder in this book than the other ones do. And again, I don't know if that's because originally it was released in a magazine, um, if it was supposed to be a different type of take. Um, And then he also uses um, one of the guys, one of the lords as bait for the the Striga. Um, And again, 
I don't know if they really took a whole lot of time and I could be misremembering, but there are some of these characters or some of these monsters that they really don't take a whole lot of time explaining. Um, you know, I, I, the, the fandom for the Witcher is great. And I ended up looking up what a Striga was, but, um, you know, like we know what elves are, we know what dwarves are. If you spend any time in fantasy, but there were a couple other monster names that, could have used a little bit more depth in the explanation. Maybe that's just me. Um, but so, yeah, go ahead. So then kind of my take on that first little story arc or short story, I, I guess he does seem a little harder, so to speak, but mm-hmm. it could also be um, the town he was in or whatnot, if it was a rougher town versus some of the other ones, he seems to be more, you know, okay. known or different backstory or setting for everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the part, I guess, that kind of hooked me at the beginning is so he kills the three guys. He's now got the guard coming at him and he totally just whips out his Jedi mind trick. You know, these are not the droids yeah. you are looking for. Yeah cast a spell and has um you know completely 180 and just start escorting him to the king so i i enjoyed that that was that was a nice little touch there um but then i don't know it's it kind of just hinted at a lot of stuff without solidifying anything yeah Uh, the whole conversation with the king and it goes into when he's actually going to take out the monster um and you get to see his, I guess, compassion side. Like, he could easily just kill it, take the money and run, and he right. ends up getting injured there due to him wanting to comfort a scared girl who has just reverted back from being this monster. And yeah. due to that, she's not, like, fully reverted yet, and she's in the midst of the transformation, and he ends up getting his his throat cut. I also think this is the only one or one of the few that he utilizes the elixirs. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. In in the last wish, this is um, one of the few that he utilizes the elixirs and we get to see a bit of, you know, his own personal code as well as just like his intellect. Right. Um, earlier when he's talking to the Castellans and, and the, the king and he's hearing about, you know, the money and the other people that attempted it before. I think there was a moment where, uh, you know, he, he kind of brought up, it's like, well, if, if I think it was like another witcher, um, thought it was too tough for this then, price. Yeah. Then it's yeah, actually yeah. higher. Yeah. Then obviously the danger is greater than that. Um, and you know, as much as he is like this, this strong badass, uh, he does get injured. Right now, granted, he let his guard down, but it also shows that he's a mortal man. Yeah, he's a mutant. He's stronger than the average man and quicker, but he's still mortal. So, um, yeah. Um, it, oh, go ahead. And the other thing that kind of bugs me is with them all being short stories, like you have no reference to where chronologically that happened. You know, mm-hmm. that could have been later in progression than everything else you know that could have been he's fed up with everything he's just gonna go and deal with that and that's why he killed the guys it could be the beginning you know he thought he was someone a hero and fighting for justice and you know had to put the smack down on these bar thugs or whatever yeah so so that bugs me the um oh let me let me reference it here uh the voice of reason goes back and forth as far as the time hop goes. But according to the Goodreads, the individual stories um, are supposed to take place chronologically. So okay, uh, take that for what you will. Um, but yeah, it, it, and the Voice of Reason is technically the first one, but it's pretty much a bonus short story that they use to tie together all these other short stories for the book. Um, my understanding is these short stories were published elsewhere. And then the last wish, the title of the whole book is the last story arc 
in this book. Um, and then they just use all those other short stories with the voice of reason going back and forth. Um, yeah, the voice so of yeah. reason jumps in after every story arc. And for me, it was kind of like a palate cleanser. So mm -hmm. you had, you know, him deal with the king and the striga or the daughter. And then, you know, the voice of reason, the next arc, it's uh, oh, a priestess who he's been dealing with for a while and is very medically versed or magically mm -hmm. healing. And the voice of reason, I feel, also kind of helps introduce us to, like, the magic of the world a little bit more, at least through the the um, the gods or the temples. Um, and Geralt very much, we find out, has no faith. And um, it's like an atheist, if you if you will. But he has a really good relationship with this temple um, and the priestess is there. Um, some of them he has a really good relationship with, but overall, it seems like he keeps coming back there, um, for healing for other things. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I agree with you. It's a palate cleanser. It also gives us a little bit more insight, um, into Gerald and, um, you know, just shows us a bit of the world and the hostility towards the witchers um, overall with the stories, I feel like we're coming in towards the end of an age, right? Um, I think the hey. witchers. Oh, go ahead. Or right, so I think we're jumping ahead a little bit, but okay, okay. I, that one is referenced at, I think it's the sixth or seventh one, uh, mm -hmm. the edge of the world where they're pretty much like, oh, hey, look at all these other people. You're yeah. literally trying to run yourself out of a job. You're trying to take care of all the monsters, which is your employment. You need monsters so that you can take care of them. Mm. And that's uh, anyway. My my reference with the earlier ones was just like the interaction with like some of the guards and everything. The fact that they didn't want him around. Um that you feel, you know, like if, if they were really in high demand, well, I guess, yeah, overall, um, a lot of people view them as a necessary evil, but we just get the vibe as the story progress that they're needed less and less. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah. the and voice that... of reason, the witcher, and then, um, you have any other thoughts on the witcher? You're ready to break down. A grain of truth. Oh, uh, yeah. I was going to say going to a grain of truth. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, a grain of truth is another short story. Um, uh, and I, this, this one may not have been like my absolute favorite, but it was definitely up there for me. So, you want to go ahead and, and start breaking it down or? Yeah. Uh, so, Side note, it kind of gave me that like Beauty and the Beast flipped on its head vibe because mm -hmm. you've got he ends up he's off the beaten track or path track off the beaten path, finds two dead bodies. One has the rose on it, which mm -hmm. in Beauty and the Beast, you have the rose and the time capsule thing in the jar. So it made mm -hmm. me think of that. Um, he ends up noticing a woman and then she disappears so we get a little glimpse of oh what's that anyway and then you get the mansion that looks deserted and he's walking through the courtyard or whatever and this bear-like thing uh neville neville mm -hmm. i don't know i'm gonna butcher the names i'm sorry uh ends up charging him and then, i think that sounds right neville ends up charging him and of course, like he's got this this sixth sense or whatever that it's not really a threat or dangerous and he's poised to strike. And then they just kind of start having this conversation and he's like, oh, are we going to just, you know, stand here all day? And they have the back and forth. And I I enjoyed the back and forth with it and how he's like, oh, well, if we're not going to stand here, should we sit down? You know, what what should we do? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I. You know, we, we've talked about it before, but, you know, stories, whether it be fantasy, sci-fi, fiction, 
there's so many lessons and takeaways um, from these different books. And for me, like one of the big takeaways, especially from this short story, is like not all monsters, quote unquote, are evil and not all like humans are good, right? And we see that with Novellin. Like he tries to intimidate um, Geralt of Rivia, yet, like you said, he kind of has this sixth sense where he's on his guard and goes to defend himself, yet he doesn't just strike him down because he's a monster, right? Um, he he ends up um, kind of not really taking advantage, but calling on his uh, hospitality, right? And coming into his house and Novellin has fun kind of showing off that he can conjure grape or grapes and food and, and wine out of thin air. And uh, yeah, yeah. And, and then Gerald, um, for this one, it, it also helped us kind of see his mutations and how he's different, right? Where Novellin asked him to look up on the wall and see his uh, his portrait and Geralt doesn't even have to get up. He can just look at it and see it in the uh, the low light. Um, and there's a couple moments of tension there. And the first time I, I read through it, you know, I was kind of wondering how he's going to handle this because he's a witcher. He's supposed to be quote destroying monsters. Well, uh, but then he he kind of has that. Well, not all monsters are monster, but he kind of has that out where. He says, oh, you're not a monster because you can touch the silver um, silverware and that he has him grab his necklace and look at the necklace so he wouldn't be able to touch it if he was a monster. And granted, we don't know exactly where that falls because his medallion also emanates with power or vibrates or whatever when magic's being done around him. So it's not... I th There's a lot there that didn't mm. get explained or I missed or point I'm five. You, like, I, I wish I had a better understanding of how his medallion worked. We got some little snippets of it throughout the short stories, um, but it wasn't really fully explained, I don't believe. I don't I, and I mean, that's, you know, it didn't exactly hook me throughout this, but mm. I enjoy the fantasy esque realm, the different mm. races, the monsters, mm. the battle. And the battles didn't really do it for me either, but I want to know more about the system. And with this being a point five, I can I can justify it. Yeah. And then the part about a grain of truth that really, I guess, flipped things on its head, why it's not just Beauty and the Beast for me, was the actual monster who has, is... I can't remember the name is feeding on other people and has to drink the blood of our Nebelin, our mm -hmm. bear like beast guy mm -hmm. to continue to transform him. Yeah, uh, she, she's yeah. a bad one. And then once she gets taken out. Yeah. And um, like you're saying, Beauty and the Beast vibe and like Novellin took in these young girls um, for like a year at a time because he initially thought like a kiss was going to cure him from this monster like image that he has and turn him back into a man. Um, but he ended up giving up on that. Yet it was the death of his true love, this other monster that cured him. Right. Yeah. Um, and it kind of hints at, you know, the, the magic there behind, um, you know, love and breaking of curses, but it has to be true love. Um, I, each of them were they're very unique for me, like between the first one we talked about where something about a sarcophagus and had to be out in the daylight or occupied for so long for the child to revert and then having a separate I don't know. They they all seem very unique, and it seems that the author understands a lot of the, you know, fairy tales like a frog and a prince kind of yeah, deal, yeah. or Beauty and the Beast, or we'll see a lot more of those, but spun I, in a I different light. 
I think you hit it right there. Um, it very much has the fairy tale vibe, but darker, more mature. Um, which actually, maybe, maybe not because I think fairy tales. I think Disney, but a lot of those Disney fairy tales are based off of older, darker fairy tales. But I'm I'm going way out there. Uh, so the next short story the lesser evil. And again, I feel like all of these short stories kind of had their own little takeaways and lessons here. Um, the lesser evil, the fourth story and the last wish, um, again, published somewhere else before they ended up putting it in the last wish. Uh, but it has Geralt showing up with a Leviathan. Oh no! Rides into Leviathan with a uh, Kikamora, um, and again, like some of these monsters, um, I'm just not as familiar with, and I've spent a lot of time in fantasy, which would have been nice if they kind of explained them a little bit more. Um, but he's uh, he's been here before. He runs into um, an old friend, the Catamelin. Um, to try to see if there's a bounty for it. And when they get ready to get rid of it, uh, they say, hey, why don't we take it to a wizard, um, the local wizard? And Geralt, you know, shows that he knows more than the average guy. He's like, a wizard wouldn't want this. It it's, doesn't have any components that he can use. But, hey, like, I'd like to get paid. Why don't we give it a shot, right? Um, and then what happens from there? So, you know, due to him being a witcher, he doesn't get along with wizards. It kind of sets that precedent initially. But then as soon as he shows up to the tower, the wizard's tower, uh, there's like a automatic doorbell or whatnot, essentially saying, hey, we don't accept or we're not. Uh, uh, blah, is not currently accepting visitors. And then he pretty much you know, says, hey. Uh, you need to do your job. The wizard's supposed to protect everyone in the town. I'm going to leave this here for you. Do something about it. And then that gets the wizard's attention. And he's pretty much like, oh, hey, is that really you? And at this point, you know, our main guy's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm tired of this. It is me. You know, what's mm -hmm. going on? Uh, gets led into the wizard tower. And sure enough, it's, uh, it's an old friend going by a different name. And that's one thing. I kind of enjoyed and I wish I got to see more of the side characters. He mm -hmm. you get to see how the Witcher is perceived in several different lights. And for right. this arc, you know, he knows the mayor or whatnot. He's buddy buddy with him, you know, hangs mm -hmm. has dinner with the mayor and his wife and whatnot. So they're, they're good friends, you know, was thinking, Oh, well, I don't like wizards and then goes and instantly he's like, Oh, Hey, you know, long time, no see. And then we get like a little hint into the, uh, do you believe in fate? Yes. Where he brings him in or, or yeah, destiny. Yeah. And yeah, it's right. Really? Real quick, I want to get um, more into the lesser evil, but a couple people brought up some good points. Uh, we have Dylan here, who's also an avid uh, book reader, and I've checked out his booktube channel. Give him a shout out. Um, he says, interesting note on the monsters and the reader's unfamiliarity with it. Uh, he had similar experiences not being as familiar with the monsters um but said that well known to the polish readers um so okay, again that's something, true. yeah maybe there's more um more familiarity there and i've read some similar reviews where the translation isn't as um good as in the original Okay. Um, but yeah, Dylan said the description of these monsters is lacking, which leaves us English readers without a clear picture. And uh, that's I, why we yeah. had to go and actually make a picture. That's why it's now right. a, a Netflix original. 
Yeah. But well, yeah, I, that makes sense. It's uh, foreign fairy tales that we're not as familiar. Yeah, and I um, the fandom is pretty good, but I ended up having to look up some of these uh, monsters just to get um, a better a better picture and kind of to understand them. Um, but yeah, thanks for that, Dylan. Uh, yeah, so back into the lesser evil, um, we we get a bit of the history there between the wizards and the witchers, right? And a little bit more of his moral compass. Um, and that, there's really some good dialogue about like, um, I, 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 I at least got the vibe from him, like evil is evil, right? Like there is no quote lesser evil yet. We see some of that with him, um, later in the series where he has to make some decisions that he's not always, uh, happy with. Right. Yeah, it's, I don't know. He essentially writes off a lot of things due to his Witcher code, mm. but at the same time, it's his own whatever he feels like doing, and it's primarily based off of his moral compass. Mm -hmm. um, and due to what he's seeing, like kind of like that first little story arc where... You know, most of the people just wanted to kill the little girl who had been transformed into this when mm -hmm. he is a little different. And he strives to revert them or to break the curse if available or able. But in this story arc, it's he doesn't believe in what the curse is. So the wi the wizard is very adamant about there being a eclipse and children born after the eclipse are then right. afflicted with powers and mutations that develop as they grow. And of course, he, he doesn't believe it. He doesn't fall for it. Um, he does end up having a conversation with the assassin. I'm, I can't remember her name. And more or less, she swindles him where... Renfrey and her uh, bandits. Yeah, yeah. And I guess so... The first time we meet her, that's where there's a big difference between the first one, the Witcher chapter, and this chapter, where the first chapter, like, he just straight up kills three people in the bar, where this right. one, I felt he was a little more justified, but he's playing a lot more reserved, and I, it might be more just like a medieval-esque setting, and like, geographically mm -hmm. where they're located, because, you know, I don't mm -hmm. know anything about that beginning town, but going into this one, like, he's already buddy-buddy with the mayor, and he already right. knows the wizard. So if he starts problems, if he has whatever, and we see that at the end where he gets essentially kicked out, you know, there's a little bit of courtesy where he's like, are you injured? Mm -hmm. No. Okay, leave. But yeah. anyway, so he gets a little swindled by the assassin, and I... <sighs> I, it's real harder. quick before you, you move on from that point, I, I feel like Geralt waits for other people to throw the first punch. Um, and I can respect that about him. And I guess that's why with the first book or the second book, The Witcher, he really didn't wait for people to throw the first punch, right? He just slayed these guys and... Um, it was justified that he was trying to get the attention of the Castellan and the king, you know, to kind of expedite that. But in every other short story after that, he waits for them to throw the first punch, right? So, like, yeah, yeah, these bandits are there. We learn later on that he's perfectly capable of handling himself, but he's not going to throw the first punch, right? Um and he, he thinks he resolved it, um, Renfrey, and we start to see this common theme where people just treat him as like a hired killer, which he's not. Uh, his job is to deal with monsters, whether that be through slaying or, or dealing with the curses. Um, and the wizard basically just tries to like buy him, right? And then Renfrey just tries to buy him. And, you know, in a lot of ways, like if, the the wizard seems so justified in his actions, yet you know he was killing uh, little girls, and the only way to prove that they're they are or they aren't 
um, these monsters is with an autopsy afterwards, right? So if he goes and he slays them and then does the autopsy, it's like, oh, nope, I was wrong. Well, they're dead. And so this one has a part that doesn't quite add up for me. So right after we end up slaying the assassin, it says someone, our main guy, didn't know, pull unsheaths his sword, and then they're talking to the wizard because the wizard just came out, and he's like, oh, I need the body. I need to do an op- autopsy. And they're like, mm-hmm. you know, don't touch her. You know, you're you're yeah. not going to do it. You're not going to do any of this. But then mm-hmm. by the end of the conversation, it is him. So it's almost like there's alternate powers or she has some innate similar features to what the witchers have because they're mm-hmm. I, I don't even know, subject to something that allows them to be resilient to the elixirs and be able to see in the dark. And, you know, due to the testing, he lost the pigment in his hair. But just how he has that whole like out of body experience here where I don't know, it was it was a funky arc for me or a funky short story because, yeah, I felt that piece was a bit out of respect um, and also just not to. Well, the way it was worded, um, it was almost it was almost like a subconscious because it says, OK, someone else he didn't know, you know, took over, or not someone else he didn't know, mm. pulled out his sword and said these things. Oh, but then by the yeah. end of it, I got the feeling that it was him. So it was either like due to blind rage and not thinking clearly or due yeah. to I, I don't know, there there was a lot of extra subtle flavoring there that I would like to know more about. And yeah. yeah. And it also gave us, um, again, a taste for how underappreciated the witchers are. Um, you know, the, the common people just saw him slaying all these people and they just start throwing rocks at him. We see a bit more of his power. And even though he pretty much saved all these lives in this town, He's essentially banished and told to move on and never return, right? Yeah. Um, which, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after that one, um, a question of price, which I thought was an interesting short story. So um, we pretty much start off with Geralt getting clean shaven, washed up, um, powdered, you know, his nose, everything getting all dressed up and he doesn't know why he's there. He's just been summoned by this queen and told that he's going to attend this banquet. Um, and he's supposed to act like he's Lord Ravix of Fourhorn and sit directly next to the queen. And yeah, you know, up to this point, he's very much made it clear, like, his job is to slay monsters. Um, his job is to to do this and that. And early on with when he finally has the dialogue with the queen, um, he's like, you know, uh, he's bold enough to say, like, I think you've mistaken my profession. And the banter with the queen and Geralt, I, I, I think, is pretty fun. Um, what are your thoughts on that short story? I, yeah, I enjoy the banter. And it adds a lot to the world and the element because we get a little bit of um, flavoring with the lesser evil for fate. And then mm. with the question oh, of destiny. price or yeah, yeah. Des- destiny yeah. Um, yeah. with the question of price arc, it really drives that home because everyone's like, hey, there's a lot of back and forth. Essentially, mm. the knight shows up. And is like, hey, you know, I'm here. I need to have, I need to talk to the queen, this, that, and the other. Hey, everyone who's here who is, you know, looking for the um, princess's handed marriage, you know, you're out of luck, get out of here. And mm-hmm. you get to see it from everybody's kind of point of view where they're like, outraged, you know, this isn't possible, you know, we should just kill him now. And then they have the whole back and forth between the knight and the the queen where she's really trying to put it off 
and you know our main guy um the witcher has that whole like back and forth conversation where she eventually says hey so i need you to you know beat fate or beat destiny or make sure that she gets married to the right one hey we've got these political intrigues where we need her to be with this guy because they don't get attacked a lot and right. you know, yada dada and he pretty much emphasized that you know that's uh that's a hefty price that's something big you want to do anyway so between the night the queen you know everybody else at the party and then you get the back and forth between the princess and the knight and you know he steps up and he stops a lot of bloodshed because he's able to be like hey so if this is truly destiny then she has to say yes i'll go with you and she's got to complete it so we get a little more backstory on the world and how the witcher is developed and designed by destiny and that's how he got his powers and all right. of his stuff but you know it's essentially another beauty and the beast twist because yeah. he he is a beast from x time to x time and due to the powers of destiny and saving the king of which now he's you know collecting his reward right Hey, right. yeah, there's a I I enjoyed the arc. I was disappointed with the druid. So we get to see a little bit of the druid doing his magic and you know swirling dust or I, I don't even remember flower around Red and crumbs. spelling. Yeah. There there was a lot going on in this. Like at first, um you know, when I started this short story, I was kind of like, okay, we're we're at a dinner party. What's this about? Like we're we're here to see some some monsters get slayed, right? Like what's going on here? But it it kind of fleshed out a little bit more of the world. Um and then the druids part wasn't so clear to me as well. The um Arts druid mousesack communicating um through the the banquet where he's doing different runes and whatnot. Um, and I'm not really sure, like, I don't remember if they really explained if he was planned to be there or, um, I, I don't think they explained it, but I felt like it was, uh, you know, backup a police yeah. officer goes on patrol. He's got his sidekick. It's, it's Robin. <laughs> so the witcher is like, Hey, I don't know what, I, what's going on here. So he calls off a buddy and he brings in his backup. I was a little disappointed yeah. though. Cause I wanted to see him do more. And all he did yeah. was swirl some breadcrumbs and then, you know, say help our main guy save people at the end. So I was a little yeah. disappointed, but it made sense for backup. And um, I feel Geralt handled it well, right? Like um, at one point he could have just jumped in and slayed the knight that showed up to collect his reward. But he actually ends up saving his life um, yeah, by from blocking the blow for him. Yeah, and it kind of, like you said, it kind of lends a little bit more to Geralt's character um, and, and helps us there. But we also got a little bit more um, examples of the medallion at work, right? And how he used it to kind of sense some of the magic and stuff that was going on. Um, Which, yet again, I wish I knew more about because the druid swirling the breadcrumbs, you know, mm -hmm. was magic, kind of triggered it. But then the knight showed up and mm -hmm. couldn't remove his helm and kind of, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we, we, it, it's one of the frustrations um, for me with this story is like you get little bits and pieces and maybe that's just us. Like we we enjoy a good amount of world building and explanation and, and going down the rabbit hole with some of that stuff where these short stories um, and short stories by nature, they don't have time for that. So we just get those little bits and pieces um, and then a good amount of action and uh, some banter from our main character. Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. So we successfully broke another curse. Yes. Um, everybody lives happily ever after. 
Um, the queen is happy, even though it wasn't exactly what she wanted. So Geralt managed to uh, navigate that situation safely without um, losing his head um, or anybody get slain. And then, yeah, the next short story is The Edge of the World. And again, I'm I'm trying to figure out which my favorite short story was. Would really love to hear um, what everyone else's favorite was if they've read it in the chat. But The Edge of the World for me, I think was more of our world builder, right? Um, for The Edge of the World, we get introduced to one of Geralt's friend, the... Um, Oh, bard. Uh, I can't think of yeah, his name. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say the musician, the bard. Um, oh, I'll I'll look it up and pull it up for us. Oh, oh, Dan Dalian. Um, but yeah, he starts talking about how much harder it is to. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. Um, to Dalian, um, it's harder and harder for the Witcher to find work. Right. Um, he he talks about how he goes to all these different towns and um, the king doesn't want the dragon slain because it's the last one in this area. And, you know, we're starting to get a feel for the fact that um, humanity has kind of conquered and colonized this area and the witchers aren't as needed. Um, so they go a little bit further out. They go to the, quote, edge of the world um, to see if there's any work for uh, Gerald. So what what are your thoughts on um, the edge of the world, Pete? It would probably be my favorite arc just because we do get kind of a second character or a, there, there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, there's a lot more development for the world because we do get to see, um, I guess it's really our first one that we get to see another race. The It's not devil, it's pronounced differently, but it's not a, a spell like the girl in the first one. It's mm-hmm. not, you know, kind of like the Beauty and the Beast one. It's not like Grain of Truth where he was transformed into it. It it is what it is and i I don't know so there was there's that element we get to see um elves up in the mountain towards the end of it so foreshadowing that's something that i actually know and that is unique and interesting but it really you know kind kind of drives home that they're they're putting themselves out of work that Mm. due to them being successful and getting jobs taking out the monsters they will then no longer have jobs and then you get that you know 180 at the end where the elves are like oh so you're not human either how are you dealing with this and he's like "Ah, i get by i get by and Mm -hmm. it kind of in my mind you know there are a lot of other books that we read where what is good and what is evil and Mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of these humans skirt the Mm -hmm. line and that's where he's just trying to do his own thing um and we get to see that in the very first arc the witcher where Mm -hmm. he does let that other guy die now i think it was all geographically based you know due to being a hard city due to the political um battling and you know seeing a guy down on his luck you know he's gonna help out the king by reverting his daughter back and take out this uh political problem yeah real real quick i want to i want to keep talking about um the edge of the world but dylan again brought up a couple good points and it sounds like he is very much along the same lines of what we said um commenting about how it's been a couple months since he's read it Uh, but he does remember enjoying each of the short stories individually, but found them somewhat underwhelming as a whole. Yeah. And I think that's pretty much where we're at with this, like very interested in the franchise, like the world's caught my interest, but yeah, it it was underwhelming. Um, 
Dylan said the dinner party um, was probably one of his favorites. Um, he also said, I thought the idea of a promise was really interesting, especially because it's not something I have ever seen in another story or fairy tale before. Yeah, um, I guess that's that's a good unique point because I yeah. kind of relate it to like Game of Thrones, like yeah, this king is supposed to take care of everybody, uh, but then we're going to kill him off. So it doesn't really matter uh, where these guys were, you know, hey, yeah, this is your daughter. This is someone taking the hand in marriage where that's why we're here. And what do you mean you can't honor it? Like, you know about it. Like, this isn't a lie. Like, what about us? You know, we're trying to look out for the little guy and just having such a big collection of people and them all being like, well... If you can, you know, renege on this, what what makes you an honorable leader? What makes your word, you know, valid? Well, there's that component, and then I also feel the the Witcher story as a whole. We get to see um, the power of words as well, right? Um, where I believe it's the queen that ends up lifting the curse. Um, from from the knight who comes to collect, as well as just um, Geralt insisting that they ask three times, and destiny, and just all these other um, unseen forces that go into it. Um, but yeah, I I really enjoyed the story, The Edge of the World. I'm with you. I think there might be some foreshadowing here to see um, some future conflicts. Um, with the elves and as much, you know, like you, you typically see elves as like these good, pure, um, creatures, right. And, and a lot of the typical fantasies, um, but when we meet them, it's after he's had the interaction with the devil who refuses to leave, but they're trying to figure out like why this devil's so greedy and He's gathering resources for the elves, right? Yeah. Um, or they're dying. And Geralt has the interaction with them where um, you know, he he's he's trying to make sense of it, and the elves get so offended by the pity in his eyes. And, you know, the elves are like, you know, unlike you guys, we we don't go and and rape the land and, you know, destroy it like it gave to us freely. Um, you know, we, we lived in coexistence and, you know, Gerald's kind of like, well, come on, like you, you could buy this stuff. You could come in and coexist with us. You know, this world's big enough, um, but the elves won't have it. Right. He's kind uh, of like, yeah, oh, they just throw coexist. it back. What, in his... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. They just kind of throw it back in his face. Like, Oh yeah, if yeah. we, we can coexist where we can get, you know, the grain, but we start coexisting with your women and with other things and we're going to be thrown out. And yeah, yeah. then and, that's where they also twist it. And you get to see that witchers aren't really accepted because they are no longer human by that point. They may have been at one point, but. Yeah. And um, yeah, for me with fantasy, I think in a lot of ways it, it, um, you know, we're in this other world. Uh, it, it also kind of deals with a lot of those same issues, right? Where people as a whole don't always um, accept what they don't understand or what's different. So you, you see that through like, yeah, the witchers are different. And even though they're doing good and contributing to this world, they get shunned in their own way. And, um, you know, the half breeds like get shunned in their own way. Um, and to kind of like experience that through these stories, you, you get a bit of empathy for, for these individuals. Um, Another point I, I enjoyed was our side character, our bard brought mm -hmm. good counterpoint and context to it to where, you know, he's like, what? I didn't do anything to you guys. And our main guy pretty much is saying, well, think about it from their perspective. It doesn't matter you know, you are this human, it matters that you are human and it just kind of lumps them all yeah. into a group. And yeah. Yeah. 
yeah it you know it it was a sad ending right because um you know Geralt kind of pokes at at the elf um talking about when when you're starving when when you know um you're too busy focusing on your pride and and you finally have that death wish and you come out of the mountains to to die um you know you'll remember my pity um and yeah it hey. you're old. go ahead i guess i didn't see it quite the same i didn't see it so much as a snub as in like you're gonna do this anyway i saw it as i uh, oh god reverse triggering from okay. baba verse whatever that's called oh man brain fart uh reverse psychology anyway okay reverse psychology because he's pretty much like hey i'm i'm here i'm doing it you know it's not the best but i'm coexisting you know you guys mm -hmm. could do it and they keep giving him excuses and problems and he's like all right well when you guys are are done feeling sorry for yourself and you really need it you know i'll be here i i see it as kind of a, a reverse psychology like hey i i'm trying to give you a counterpoint to the interest here mm -hmm but you understand this is where it's going, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, times, times are changing. Um, you can either adapt and coexist or um, face extinction. So, and then last but not least, the last wish. Um, so yeah my understanding is this one is one of the only short stories um that Not the last chronological wish was... no uh no i was just going to say like i think this one um the first publication was in the last wish where they pulled oh, okay. all the short stories together um but yeah it um and again, the, the little short stories in between the voice of reason kind of help us tie it all together. Um, but the last wish was pretty interesting. Um, we have our, our trusty bard and Gerald uh, fishing. Supposedly, Dendillion um, put a crow on the line when Gerald was sleeping, um, trying to play a prank on him. And I think he does a good job kind of balancing out um the characters there you know the the, the seriousness of, yeah yeah because Gerald's so serious right his tone and everything and then you have the musician who's just trying to do whatever um but they end up getting a genie or a gin right caught on the end of the line um and then yeah pick it up from there Pete or so yeah, there, were, there. I think there's actually two lines. One got a fish, and of course okay. the counterpoint or the opposite, where um, the Witcher is pretty much saying like, "Hey, the line's too tight. You need to give it some slack so you don't break it." Where the mm -hmm. Bard's like daydreaming about eating this fish, and he's just like, "You know, get it in. Yeah. Let's do Turn it." Turn the head into soup or whatever. Yeah, and so that that doesn't quite work out, and. So the line snaps and then he's got another one and he's like, oh, it's just hit hit bottom or it's stuck on something mm -hmm. ends up pulling it up. And yet again, the bard's got his own idea of uh, what's going on. And the witcher has to or so they pull the genie out. Witcher's like, oh, I don't know what that is, whatever, whatever. The bard's like, oh, it's it's a genie. It's got a witch or a uh, wizard seal and a mark and all this on it. Opens it up and just, I I'm a little confused between the seal and the transition and everything because like the genie comes out, the bard gets two wishes off, which we have no context if they ever come to flourishing or if anything ever happens. And so he's he's damaged. Um, I, the Witcher... I actually I was in the same boat with you the first time I, I read through this, and it wasn't really until the second time around that it started to click. Uh, but yeah, the, the genie doesn't grant any of his wishes because it's Geralt 
that got the seal. So it was Gerald's or three wishes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, that, that makes yeah. more sense. And his first wish, which we end up finding out later, you know, like at this point, um, it's really built up my trust in him. You know, he knows all these seals. He knows all these, um, this kind of like magic and everything and, and how to counter all this stuff. And then we find out a little bit later in the story that um, the chant that he said was basically to the genie, hey, go get lost and go screw yourself. Um, and that technically was his first wish. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah. have this huge, powerful genie and everything. And he, he pretty much recited um, this chant or whatever to try to get rid of him. And he did. But it was pretty much because of his first wish where he told him to, you know, As... go, go blank himself, trying to keep it PG. And uh, now this character who we've seen in two little arcs and, you know, we've got feel for the counterpoint is dying. And then silly humans and their rules, you know, we got a curfew going on and so he can't get help. Uh, we end up meeting some elves, which mm -hmm. it didn't didn't really seem very elf ish. Well, it kind, of, kind of felt lackluster. We meet two elves and a half elf. And I think most of our interaction is with the half elf, um, Radomir, uh, where they inform him that there is a sorceress that might be able to help um, Yennefer of Vendingberg. Um, and we start to get some of the, the political turmoil and everything in this town um, from Yennefer. And uh, we end up learning later is um, Geralt's love interest for the series, um, which... Mm, I, I go ahead. So, sidestep. Speaking of airplanes, each one of these little story arcs made some sense. Like the Witcher. Okay, he goes and he reversed a curse of a daughter who you know had a spell put on her. You know, grain of truth. You know, Beauty and the Beast. You know, fairy tale. Say, oh, a whatever a kiss from whoever will save you, you know, lesser evil. Like that is something he had to do. The name of the book is the last wish. Mm -hmm. The name of this arc is the last wish. And mm -hmm. they don't tell us what it is. Like yet they, again, not they, until we go through it, it through the second it. time, did it all, you know, make some semblance of sense where his, uh, disenchant speech thing turned out to be his first wish and then after they you know after his love interest has taken advantage of him put him under a spell he goes and you know essentially takes these political figures bend, bends them over his knee and starts spanking them yeah and, yeah. and all, all that and he's in the uh in the prison and he uses another wish, which explodes one of the guards. And right, then we know wish. what happens after the wish, but we don't know what the wish is. And then in the voice of reason afterwards, it's kind of like hinted at that. Now they're bound by fate, but it, I don't know. It, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it well, irked I, me. I think it's the priest, um, as Geralt's already off doing his own thing. Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, I pulled a quote here. It says, it's not that simple, but if, if he express the right wish, if he somehow tied his fate to fate, uh, no, I don't think it would occur to him. And it's probably better if he doesn't. So here he is just trying to help out, um, his bard buddy. We get to meet Yennefer. Um, who's this powerful sorceress and everything, you know, portaling around the city, um, because of all the everyone hate. off. And you know, she, she ends up tricking him and trying to capture this genie, but she can't because, um, they haven't done the last wish. Right. 
And as he goes to to quote unquote save her, um, she's con- she keeps saying, you know, like, oh, you know, wish for whatever, wish for, you know, to be human, wish for gold, wish for so on and so forth. Um, and she's struggling to capture this gin, this genie. And um, yeah, it, they realize like, depending on the wish, one of them could die and he doesn't want her to die. Right. Um, so yeah, they don't come out and quite say it. And I wonder if we'll find out more in, um, the later books. Um, but yeah, he somehow supposedly they imply that he ties his fate to her. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so they like, both survive. And there's a lot of interesting speculation there, too. Because yeah. supposed wizards and sorcerers live a really long time. So how how does that all work? Does yeah. Anyway. That and, like, there's... And maybe it's just because of a short story and it had to happen that fast. But it goes from, hey, I need your help. Save my mm-hmm. friend. Mm-hmm. Okay, I've saved your friend. Just kidding, you're under my spell. You're gonna go be, you know, make a fool of yourself, fight my battles, get yes. captured. To hey, thanks for letting me use you. Um, I'm gonna go capture this genie so I can have more power and do more things in whichever nature to bound chick a bound bound. Like, how did what I miss I missed a chapter. Somewhere, I, I was going to comment a bit about that too. You know, like, uh, not not a huge romance reader, but like, there's romance in a lot of the books we read, and typically, you know, there's more buildup, there's more chemistry there, and then yeah, all of a sudden, he's tying his fate to her, and we get a little bit of it in um, the Voice of Reason short stories in between where like you understand that you know this is his love interest but yeah within a couple days or whatever not even to um and i guess there's like a little bit there like you know he's a mutant he's used to being you know the outcast he sees her realizes that you know like she used to be disformed and, and all this stuff and used to being the outcast. So maybe there's a bit of that there, but yeah, it didn't really score high for me on the believability. And, well, and then afterwards, like, yeah, their fates are tied to each other, but he didn't follow through. Uh, as far as I understood, he just kind of kept on going like I, yeah. I get all the feels and I get why it worked out the way it was. And you see in several of the other story arcs for how he, you know, he didn't want to kill the assassin mm-hmm. during the lesser evil, you know, mm-hmm. arc. He, he didn't. Yeah. It's. He was yeah. doing it to save people, but I guess that's a good point where he's a mutant or he's not human anymore. And she, is still human but is in a completely different league so it's not like he could go for a casual person or a normie and then (laughs) you know he's got like these weird communications through the priestess and yeah i don't know it's uh, it just irks me that we don't actually know what the last wish is and the whole basis of this book around his love interest and everything, like, he doesn't even follow through with it. You know, he's kind of just like, oh, hey, well, take these stones at the end and, you know, this will help her out. And the priestess is like, this is nothing. You know, this is chump change to her. Uh, and he's like, well, I don't know what to do. And it just shows that he's uh, not well versed due to his uh, exile. They- they they probably don't cover that in the Witcher training how to um, properly court fair maidens or um, sorceresses or or whatnot. Yeah. So um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Final thoughts on the book, Pete, you going to, you going to continue the series. So there is enough stuff out there where they've got the comic book, they've got the books, they now mm-hmm. have the um, live action adaptation, which typically I don't go for, but with this being from a foreign author, I'm probably going to continue the books and then reference or watch the uh, Netflix because I, I don't think they're very far. I don't know how they line up or if they're canon or whatnot, but uh, I, I'm i interested in the magic system, in the world, in the creatures, if you will. Mm-hmm. And... Mm-hmm. I yeah I'm I'm gonna continue it. It's it's a big franchise. I like the the medieval, um, magic esque vibe I got, but yeah. you know it was very lackluster in regards to like world building in regards to character development. Like we didn't mm-hmm. really get anything about the Witcher. We just kind of got like a moral compass. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, same thing with the elves. Like, we saw the mountain elves, and they're pretty much like, hey, we need to survive. You guys suck. You're destroying everything. And then we got an elf during the Last Wish arc, where literally the only thing he was good for is while, you know, our main guy was all bow chicka bow wow. He's like, oh, we should give him some time. So, okay, elf hearing, like, he got me on that one. But that was all he was good for. You know, like, uh, he didn't have any, you know, he, innate he, he healing powers. Some... He he just was like, I can, you know, dress the wound. He he had some he had some good quotes, though, because um, I think it was, like, Dandelion, uh, who was all like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? Da, 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 da. Um, and, you know, El good old elven hearing um he's like oh um uh i i'm i'm not much for grand words or something like that and i could only explain it with grand words so let's let's give them let's give them some time yeah yeah Um, leave them in the rubble uh yeah yeah um like i said i'm i'm with you uh very interested in the world, the franchise sucker for some dark fantasy um, was disappointed in the first book, but there was enough there that I definitely want to give a couple more um, books of this series a shot, see if they, they do a better job catching my interest. Probably going to check out the Netflix uh series eventually i know that they got signed up for a second season um but yeah 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 so next week on what day peter sunday 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 8 p.m eastern and forever and always until the end of time as long as it makes sense, we're going to keep geeking out over different books and book series every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for everyone. Thank All you right. to everyone who showed up. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Right. Uh, yeah. Star Sight by Brandon Sanderson, the yes. second book, or no, sorry, Star Word? No. Sight? Yeah. So you have Skyward book oh, okay. one, and Star Sight book two and the skyward series is what we're geeking out over next week um it's a young adult science fiction book by you know we're big fanboys of brandon sanderson looking forward to geeking out over it hope you guys can join us for that um we should have a couple more guests on to talk to us about that and if you're interested in putting your face up on camera and talking about some books with us and or you have a book series that you want to recommend for us to consider geeking out on, please reach out to us on our social media links below. And yeah, anything else, Pete? Uh, sorry, I cut you off during the thank you for joining us. Much appreciated here. 
Yes. Special shout out to Dylan for all the comments and understanding there. Thank you very much, sir. Yes. Yes. Definitely go check out his channel as well. Um, and yeah. Thank you kindly. And we hope to geek out with you guys again next week. Bye. Bye.